The Antifada is more than a podcast. It's a specter haunting the globe. It is the synthesis of the two most frightening things for the cheerleaders of this reactionary hell world. One ravaged by the unbounded savagery of capital and its states. Antifa super soldiers and intifada. Bash the fash and the global uprising. Be prepared to enter the Antifada Mindset. I'm Jamie Peck. And I'm Sean Baby. And we are broadcasting not live from Left is Best headquarters, about a half hour walk away from the gentrification ravaged Gowanus Canal in the coastal elite bubble of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. That's right. And we are proud to have in studio today a old friend and a good comrade, Asher Dupuy Spencer with uh, Verso Books. Hi, Asher. How you doing, guys? Happy to finally make it. All right. Thanks for being here. Thank you for being here. We uh, we understand you got a busy life. You got kids. You got two kids. That's that's crazy. Mm-hmm. That's, I can't that's even tw- think about that. That's twice as many as I had a year ago. Mm-hmm. Well done. And <laughs> two more than we have. And how red are their diapers? Red enough. Red I mean, <laughs> I mean. <laughs> You're making him nervous. Like he can't even. He doesn't even want to think about the joke because he's like, oh, are they pooping blood? No. <laughs> That, 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 What's I, wrong with my I kids? Never think about that I aspect. wanted to make a joke about that, and I felt actually like deeply uncomfortable doing that. So I yeah, just, <laughs> can just roll with this. That's a oh, father. That's a yeah, meta, meta, in, 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 meta, in metaphor lo- only. Uh, oh thankfully. man. Yeah. So um, let's see. How shall we? How shall we describe our relationship with Asher? I think a good story to start with maybe is the time he talked me into jumping off a cliff, just as an example of his immense rhetorical abilities. Yeah, th- I'm not going to showcase them today. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I think a more important part of that story actually is how we uh, how we found our way to that quarry. That's mm, right. Mm-hmm. I think that portion of the story actually gets to the heart of the kind of uh, just general all around uh, resourceful uh, guy that Asher is. Uh, because where were we? We were in uh, New Hampshire. Uh, yes. We were staying at a uh, a family friend's cabin, beautiful cabin. Uh, it was you and I. We had been dating for a couple of years, and uh, Asher and his ex, who shall not be named, and uh, we had a grand old time. And, and uh, my dog. And Motor. Let's not forget Motor. Yeah. Very important. Best dog. It was a beautiful day out, I remember, and we wanted to get outdoors. And so, unfortunately, we didn't know of any swimming holes around there. None of the people at the house could tell us where we could find one. We were looking for a quarry. We were looking for a spring. We were looking for something to jump off of. So we were kind of at a loss, uh, but we really wanted to swim. So how did, uh, how did you come up with a solution to this problem as a resourceful guy that you are? Well, people who have known me for a long time know that I was a teenage dirtbag. And original dirtbag. Yeah, right? absolutely. And uh, yeah, oh, yeah. Sorry, I forgot that that had another meaning. It's just mm. it's very mm-hmm. far from my existence. <laughs> that's, that's um, good. But that's yeah, good. so I was you know so I I was a teenage dirtbag, and I know, therefore, how how teenage dirtbags think and where to find them. So I said, let's go to a gas station and see who's hanging out there with skateboards and and razors and BMX bikes and see if we can offer them some Budweiser, Newports and. Uh, some money to buy a dime bag of weed or something. And by God, D- Jamie was a little dubious. I was a little less dubious because I know this guy. But by God, did we not just jump in the car, go a couple of towns over, found a ge- find a gas station, and of course hang out in front of this gas station. I mean, in these... my memory, it must have been a 7-Eleven or a Stewart's. It was, it, was, yeah. it was something mm-hmm. like that. Mm-hmm. It was these two kids, and they were like straight out of Central Cassie and Gummo. Yeah, they, <laughs> they were like they were, kids from Gummo. <laughs> they had uh, BMXs, they had rat tails, and uh, oh, yeah. you like, know, wow, little, there they are. Little yeah. dirt stashes, <laughs> and Asher's like, we found our people. <laughs> and uh, he went up to him, or we went up to him, and uh, I think the kids were like, you know, can we find a swimming hole? You know, can you take us there? They're like, yeah, we could take you there. It's going to cost you a six-pack of Budweiser <laughs> and a pack of Marlboros. And we're like, you got it, 13-year-olds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we followed them in our car. They were on their bikes. And we followed them it, to the, the place where we could... It was like a scene from E.T. Like I remember them, yeah, I remember them really of, zipping along. <laughs> I mean, they were really going. We had mm-hmm. to, we had mm-hmm. to yeah. chase them uh, with the car on their little BMXs. But they did indeed. They, they lived up to their promise. Even though we did keep the cigarettes until they actually showed us where the, mm-hmm. the place was. I feel, I feel really guilty about that as a dad, I just want to say. Yeah. <laughs> But think about yeah. if you were 13 and you got a pack of cigarettes and a six-pack, you'd be really, really psyched. 
Yeah. So they showed us where it was. There was a quarry in the middle of the woods. With, there were some swastikas painted on some rocks there, but we ignored that, that part. That might have been the first indication that things could go wrong. Yeah, yeah. And then um, there was a rope, rope swing that people would uh, swing and jump off into the water. And uh, I was a little hesitant to try it. I just want to say I've never heard the transition from swastika to rope. <laughs> just like <laughs> feel so like deeply innocuous but yeah well mm-hmm. that's that's the nazi quarry for you mm-hmm. yeah it really lets mm-hmm. your guard down yeah. before it gets you yep yep so and two two things two bad things happened the first one wasn't all that bad it was uh you know i have a lousy back and i jumped in the water maybe like the third or fourth time off uh, a pretty perilous rope swing and i end up throwing out my back and uh barely made it out of the water and uh my time on the rope swing was done but then Jamie and Asher uh, oh my God. went on without me. So. Well, everyone else was making it look really easy, but I still didn't know if I should do it because I'm weak and a coward. And Asher kind of egged me on. He's like, come on, Jamie, you do dangerous stuff all the time. You do drugs. Why won't you do this? And I was like, oh, Good your point. logic has defeated me. <laughs> so I, you know, climbed up the tree, grabbed onto the rope, not really thinking about the fact that I have no upper body strength whatsoever. And uh, I swung, swung down. I lost my grip on the rope almost immediately, but I still had enough forward momentum to go over the edge, just barely. Um, did a flip in the air and narrowly missed bashing my head on the rocks and fell in the water. It was very close. I, uh, Do you we, remember who dove in the water after you? I remember. It was Motor. Yes. None of you, motherfuckers. Good puppy. Oh, my just God. Motor. I had your phone in my hand, and I was videotaping that from about 50 <laughs> feet away. And I must have uh, gone completely ghost white. I was scared so shitless because as you did the flip, I mean, you don't do justice to how close you came. As you were doing there the flip. There is a video. There we is, can post the video. Oh, God. I, I never want to watch that again, but other people can. No, you were like going to delete it. I was like, don't you fucking delete that. I that's content. Oh, that's horrible content. That scared the shit out of me. Your head, Your head was like inches away from just getting hey i had to open. live that near-death experience i might as well you get, loved it you got out of the well water you were like woo, that was fun and we're no, all like, i did not shit. say that i said i'm i'm okay like because yeah. i knew that you were all worried and then motor was the most worried i think of anyone so it was successful except for me throwing out my back and then having to crawl to the use the bathroom for the next two days mm, yes and you potentially almost dying uh in the water. Oh, and, but uh, after that, every time I went in the water, because I was like, yo, if I don't keep on jumping in the water and have as much fun as possible, I'm letting the Nazis win. It's actually like it's, it's sort of an interesting case in, this, in, the, in these, these days of, um, of trauma references and trigger warnings, etc. To look at how that effect, how that, how that moment affected uh, motor's development as a oh, being. Yeah. Because now, actually, anytime anyone jumps into water with a splash, he dives in and goes completely. Oh man! Wow! And he's he, he's like uh, filled with concern. So you you scar wow. you scar your your frailty scarred my dog. What a good dog! There's you can say or scarred. taught him uh, taught him caution and empathy. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Taught him to be a great life saving dog. Yeah. yeah. He's a good boy. I mean, he's useless. Boy. He's not going to drag anyone out of the water. He's 50 pounds, but um, <laughs> he'll kill the shit out of some squirrels, though. Yeah. Shout out to Motor, a very good boy good boy very good found on the streets of detroit Mm -hmm. so um should we talk about a news item from the week yeah what the hell happened perhaps um a great lady left this earth shuffled off this mortal coil to go um say racist things in hell (laughs) for all eternity she was an episcopalian i don't think they even believe in hell but uh yeah well surprise (laughs) 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 your spoiler alert you're going to hell is it fair to say she's going to hell if we don't believe in hell? I suppose if there is one, she's I mean, probably there. Yeah, it's it's prob she's probably just worm food in the ground, but if there is a hell for her to go to, it would be a nice surprise. For her or for us? For us. Yeah. Cause she might dominate down there. She might kick some ass. Apparently she was a real uh Real tough cookie, that a one. Ball breaker? Yeah, she might tell that uh, that Satan a, a thing or two. Oh, God, she's like T- the queen of hell now. Tell him to clean his room and shit. Um, <laughs> there's been a, a lot... I think that's Jordan Peterson. <laughs> Satan, Jordan Peterson, six of one, half dozen, the other. So there's been a lot of, uh, a lot of reaction to this. Most of it's been the pretty standard fare when, you know, a famous old political figure or other type of uh, big uh, media figure dies... Lots of uh, condolences and certainly hagiographic. Hey, is that the word? Uh, wah, wah, blah, blah, yeah. blah. Peons to her, to her great life. 
Uh, she lived to be 92 years old, and she died in her bed holding her husband's hand. So Man. if anyone's going to go out, especially somebody who was born into the ruling class and died within the ruling class, if you're going to go out at 92 uh, in your own bed, I think that's a huge success for life. So I'm really not all that bummed about yeah. it. I think also, too, that we should perhaps take a little look at uh, her life and mm -hmm. her spawn mm -hmm. And uh, yep. maybe not do any encomiums to this woman. Yep. At the risk of getting us all in trouble, that is not how I want the next Bush to die. <laughs> I'm not going to comment on that, whether <laughs> I agree or I don't, but that's a very provocative and interesting statement. Mm -hmm. I, like I only it. wish she had lived long enough to see the inside of a Vermont gulag. <laughs> and when I say gulag, I mean, of course, the extremely humane island resort that we will be sending the ruling class to live on after the rev and dropping them they'll have everything supplies. they need they'll <laughs> have hospitals maybe a fucking movie theater some seeds some old plows but, uh, some oxen to yeah make they will food. but they will not be leaving no maybe they'll be the only ones that actually still have to sell their wage labor that's what we were thinking <laughs> is they could create their own uh libertarian hellhole on a beautiful island mm -hmm. and then we won't even have to exterminate them they'll just basically like exploit them each other out of existence it'll be yeah. great yeah like, as, as long as you put mines around the entire island and make sure they can't get off your phone. yeah and there'll be another island with all where we send all the rapists and that's just like rapist island and they can't leave they can't hurt anyone that's uh that's my non-carceral solution or mildly carceral that's solution. actually a yeah i was gonna say that's a pretty carceral a uh, yeah solution. but a nice island we're talking caribbean island yeah you know we'll, we'll so, oh, so you're gonna displace people to make room for for the rapists i mean i don't know <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're still working out the details all right give us a few years uh we'll expropriate an island uh, from your, Peter co your, Thiel. Your, your cook shops <laughs> the kitchen of the mm -hmm. future mm -hmm. yeah so um people talk a lot about how uh freedom of speech is being taken away from right-wing people on college campuses. I think we have a little counterexample to that. You want to talk about it, babe? Yeah, there's uh, another one of these stirs of a uh, ostensibly left-wing professor. This woman's named Randa Girard, and she's a tenured professor at Fresno State University. And she came out with, I believe it was a tweet that said, quote, Barbara Bush was a generous and smart and amazing racist who along with her husband raised a war criminal unquote and then she said fuck out of here with your nice words yeah so she got into a bit of uh, heat for that oh. and uh, and by the way nice words was referring to all of the many many liberals and conservatives alike who were just lionizing this woman who should know better like the fucking women's march give me a break yeah the rest in power they say that's despicable absolutely despicable the uh, the pundit classes and the media have really been uh, celebrating her. And, you know, I'm sure that she had her fine moments. Apparently, people were saying that when the AIDS crisis uh, was in the late 80s and early 90s was still in full swing, uh, she did something very generous by going to a hospital and actually embracing uh, folks with AIDS, which is a very, very positive thing. Um, I think on balance... Um, we're going to look at some quotes. I think on balance, uh, she was a nightmare person and certainly created a whole brood of nightmare people. So uh, that's something we can certainly fault her for. Um, yeah, I mean, I saw some fights on Facebook that I immediately closed out of because I was like, no, I don't have time for this. Where like bad for the soul. A friend of mine yeah. was like kind of dancing on her grave. Which, and then other people were like. Oh, my God, Julie, I have all the same politics as you. But if we lose empathy for the humanity of anyone, we are just as bad as them. And Julie was like, counterpoint, that is not true. And posted this pretty good article by Glenn Greenwald uh, that he published after the death of Margaret Thatcher called Margaret Thatcher and Misapplied Death Etiquette. Ding dong, the witch is dead. Where, I remember people uh, chanting yeah. in the streets and partying and just drinking and Britain having a grand old time. Yeah, he basically argues that um, different rules apply for the death of a public figure. And uh, the other side certainly isn't going to be silent. After they die, they're going to be creating their own uh, hagiography. And it's perfectly fair game for us to create ours. I'm not going to put together a greatest hits of Barbara Bush because I don't really want to do a deep dive into biographies of the Bush family per se. Mm -mm. But there are two things that uh, pop out. I'll read the first quote. So this uh, was happening in March of 2003. Asher, do you remember what big event was happening in March of 2003? Yeah, the, the 
the Iraq war. Yeah, that thing, that thing that happened. Uh, that was like one of the formative events of my life. I was, uh, I guess I, I was uh, 20 years old at the time. Oh, no, I was 19 at the time. I was yeah. I was 23, and we've talked about it on the show before, how demoralizing that whole thing was. Oh, let's not trouble and, our pretty little heads about that. Yeah, let's not trouble our pretty little heads. That's basically the uh, Barbara Bush mindset. She got asked by Diane Sawyer on the on television about whether her family, you know, especially her and George H. W. Bush, have been watching more T V news, you know, with the lead up and outbreak of the war. <clears throat> so Barbara Bush, uh, there's a direct quote. I watched none. Why should we hear about body bags and deaths? And how many, what day it's gonna happen, and how many this, or what do you suppose? Or I mean, it's it's not relevant. So why should I waste my beautiful mind on something like that and watch my husband suffer? Jesus Christ. Yeah, like I think that quote kind of speaks for itself. There's not Yeah, we don't have to put any spin on it. I mean, that. I just I just want to add something. You know, I think like obviously her, her her net effect on the world was obviously negative and given her proximity to power and her own power. But I think there's something interesting happening and I want to propose a a, a counterfactual which Go is for this. It. We love those. I wonder if it would be the case under a Clinton presidency whether we would see the sort of hysterical, sort of liberal madness and this impulse to, to lionize and celebrate these villains and war criminals as people that exhibited qualities like dignity, leadership, respectability, etc. Oh, definitely. I, I, like, I, I think it has a lot, I think a lot of this stuff has a lot to do with. This sort of uh, tr- Trump Trump madness. I don't know. I feel uh, like the Clintons would certainly be participating in that. No, that that I think that's absolutely that's absolutely true. I mean, I mean, the extent to which um, organizations such as like the Women's March or various sort of I don't know left of center, left of liberal um, media outlets would be so quick to offer comfort and condolences, mm. at least in the, in the, in the form that they have. There's definitely a desperation to embrace anybody who's not Trump. Like we talked about that on the last show a little bit, yeah. right, babe? Yeah, we did. And, and we talked about the general sort of tendency that Ash was talking about. And I think that, you know, I agree to, with you to the extent that um, even George W. Bush, who, if people can remember way back to nine years ago or so, was one of the worst presidents <laughs> did so many horrific things was so completely uh, unqualified uh, over his head and um just with horrific policies yeah He's but trump re- says his racism out loud right. yes. and he said it like with dog whistles except occasionally when um like the other Bush quote I was about to read where she talked about how all the people who are living in the fucking well, let, Houston yeah. Astrodome let's, now, it's like working out really well let, for them. Let's go to that one before we start talking about the rehabilitation of Bush. Go ahead and read that, that okay. wonderful quote. Okay, so, you know, it, as if anyone has forgotten, um, in the wake of Hurricane Katrina, which, um, if you recall, George Bush didn't do the best job handling the aftermath Heck of. of a job, Brownie. Um, she said... Almost everyone I've talked to says we're going to move to Houston. What I'm hearing, which is sort of scary, is they all want to stay in Texas. Dun, dun, dun. Everyone is so overwhelmed by the hospitality. And so many of the people in the arena here, you know, were underprivileged anyway. So this, this is working very well for them. Talk about out of touch. Talk about um, disgusting, no like, blessing, wow. bleach. Like, why don't you just throw a can of beans out of your car window and make two homeless people fight over it, you fucking cunt? Oof, strong words, but yeah. <laughs> like, I agree. you repti- Like, saying she's a reptilian is like letting her off easy because actually she wasn't. She was almost definitely a human being. And I just can't imagine how anyone could have so little empathy for their fellow humans. Well, but we're now supposed to have empathy for her and her family now, though, right? That's that's the flip side of things. This woman's so fucking detached. Like when, both when they these, go low, we go high. Yeah, right. Exactly. Respectability shit. Like with both of these fucking quotes, you have somebody who's what her, her father was like a publisher for McCall's. You know, tons of money. She went to private school. In the course of that, you know, at the whatever cho- wherever the fuck she was, she ends up meeting uh, George H. W. Bush. So on, but they're rich and they become richer and richer. Great political power. 
Um, now we're supposed to feel fucking bummed that this person died at 92 in their bed holding their husband's hand. I feel no fucking sympathy whatsoever. She lived her best fucking life. The best possible fucking life a human being can have. All the wealth, all the power, all the influence you could possibly have in the world, and you get to live to a ripe old age. So I'm sorry, but I'm not, I shed no fucking tears for Barbara Bush. And I don't shed any tears for her fucking family, because they're all a bunch of fucking ghouls. Every single fucking one of them. Yep. Agreed. Whenever you hear somebody trying to get all high and muddy with you about it, just read reread those quotes, and I guarantee any any bad feelings, any guilt will drain from your body. Yeah, I, I'm always partial to a more more of a quantitative approach with these sorts of things. I mean, I think maybe if people want to to mourn her death or offer condolences to her family, we ought to just demand of them that they ha- offer the same amount of feeling and empathy and sympathy to each individual dead Iraqi that, yes. that hurt. I don't know, that estimates are around a million. About a million. But this is the radio. This is a podcast. We ought to be conservative. Let's say 850,000. I don't know. That's each very, one of them. Very so, generous. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Let's, we, no. so are you saying that we should give Barbara Bush one 850,000th of our sympathy when it comes to people who have died? That, that sounds like the sort of fraction I'm looking for, yeah. yeah. I like that. It's really yeah. big of you. Yeah. to introduce these pieces we're going to be talking about today before we go too much further and i'm really glad we are talking about them because it just so happens that these topics came up on the majority report this week and uh i wasn't really that satisfied with how the conversation went uh it's not that often that i get pitched a question that gives me a chance to talk about my politics and there were a lot of factors i kind of fucked it up i i probably gave a simplistic I definitely gave a simplistic reading of what my actual views are. Uh, I also might have been interrupted by a bunch of men at the same time, so that didn't help. Uh, perhaps piled on a touch? Perhaps, yeah. So anyway, um, I, it's, it's not that often that you get a do-over. So we're going to be talking about... It's a good thing we got our own fucking podcast. Yeah, it's a good thing. I mean, that's what I think. That's what I say to myself in those moments now. You know, It used to be like, I need my own fucking show. And now it's like... Good thing I have my own show. That's right. And it's not just mine, obviously. Ours. It's ours. Our it's ours. workers cooperate. It's ours. Yeah. So this first piece is called Our Road to Power. Uh, it's by Vivek Chibber, who Sean studied under, right, babe? I took one class with him back in the day. He's a very, very brilliant man. He's uh, in the analytical Marxist tradition. He teaches at uh, NYU. Our good friend John, actually, uh, he's his advisor. Uh, So Vivek uh, is, as I said, a a very, very insightful person, the kind of guy who can basically um, speak in uh, like complete paragraphs off the top of his head on very, very complex uh, Marxist and sociological issues. So no issues with him there with his brilliance, but uh, we might have a few issues to talk about with the piece. And then the second piece is a counterpoint written by Charlie Post, also in Jacobin, called what strategy for the u.s left so the issues that chibber and post talk about are ones that are uh, in a sense timeless on the left they're uh, about analyzing how capitalism works creating counter powers to capitalism based in the working class and then also imagining how we use those forces to overcome capitalism and then what capitalism 
I'm sorry, what life after capitalism will look like, how society will be structured uh, in a more free and egalitarian world. The, those are timeless issues, and the timeliness of these interventions, I think, are twofold. The first is that they came out on the 100th anniversary of the Bolshevik Revolution, uh, which is obviously a uh, sea change in uh, human history and probably the most radical and interesting experiment in uh, socialist transformation of society. But also, I think it's timely, too, because these are huge debates that are happening on the U.S. left right now. Uh, as Jamie said, are we going to do reformism? Are we going to create cadre groups? Are we going to have revolutionary sort of activities? Mm -hmm. Are we going to do direct action, electoralism, so on and so forth? Yeah, so, and it's a time when the left is almost back to zero. So it's a very good time to be talking about what we actually want to be, what our ideology is, what our tactics are, how we're going to get there. That's right. Asher, you want to take it away? Yeah, unless we forget that, um, you know, we exist again. I think that um, we, you know, people who were um, associated with the far left to imagine themselves as part of this sort of social formation we'll call, that we can call the, the far left were essentially wandering, wandering the desert for, uh, for, for quite a long time. I want to give a very brief summary, and I hope that the, uh, the rest of the content will find its way in through discussion. But I want to begin sort of in the middle of the piece I think it'll ruffle some feathers, and I think that's what podcasts are supposed to do. Certainly this one. Sure. Yeah, so Vivek makes the claim that it's entirely hallucinatory to think about socialism realistically being the result of a ruptural break with our present mode of production, or our present mode of governance, with our present system. The idea that the, the revolutionary road to socialism is essentially closed. I think I'm probably going to defend that position cautiously and sadly, I guess sadly. Uh, Vivek looks back at the legacy of Bolshevism, the Leninist party, and begins with two dimensions of this Leninist model of, uh, of socialist politics. One, which is the party form, the vehicle meant to deliver us socialism, and the second part, um, and this, I think, is a, plays a more marginal or, or, you know, a smaller role in his article, is the, uh, the, the, the political institutions that can be developed uh, in the wake of a, of, a, of a potential victory. So I think, so the discussion of the party, I thought, was quite interesting. You know, he, he looks at, the, the, you know, he, he boils down the sort of the, the, all of the complex debate on the left around Leninism to two sort of defensible positions, one, one of which says... Well, um, everywhere that Leninist parties have come into existence, they've degenerated into uh, anti-democratic bureaucratic structures that limit participation and that are, you know, that, 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 and that tend towards authoritarianism. The other position is, well, look at the origins of, of, of Leninism. Look at the early Bolshevik party. This was a, a you know, a, a very democratic organization. And if you want to understand the turn that it took after the 1930s, that you, you need to look no further than Stalinism. In fact, at its core, this was a, you know, this, this, is, this is a good model. It's the only model. Yeah, and, and it's also one of the only ones that's been effective, right? I mean, this, this is what he wants. This is, this is what he says. And I think, I think this is, I think this is a, a powerful point. And I, and, and, so, you know, and I, 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 really, you know, I really appreciate Vivek's caution. Yeah. Right? I don't, you know, he, doesn't, he doesn't really take a position um, with respect to, the, to, to, to those two uh, ways of thinking about the party. But instead, look at, it, look at it instrumentally. Do we have any other example of an organizational form, whether it be horizontalism or, you know, the, the sort of multi-tendency party that's or been able... movements of movements. Sure, yeah. that's been able to uh, effectively and efficiently transform society, impose power, build institutions, etc. Not just make revolution, tr but, but, but also to build... Uh, social democracy from within and from without. The, you know, this was a process that um, the Leninist parties of some sort played a major role. Played a major role in. And so I, th I think that that's just to branch off of what mm -hmm. you're saying. What I got from the piece is um, what he's saying was very important. Was not just the dynamism and the democracy within the early Bolshevik party, but of course their actual base within the working people um, yeah. of Tsarist yeah. Russia, and then during the the Soviet uh, experiment. Yeah, like a point that he really harps on that I really agree with in this piece is that the left, 
the the modern day left, you know, whether you're talking about in America or internationally, it has become somewhat divorced from a working class base. And it's been increasingly um, on less working class places like college campuses or academia or NGOs. that's the same thing. Right. And, uh, and, and, like, and this is right acutely and it's true not in the United, in the United States. Yeah, it's not representative. It's not made up of the working class. The working class has less radical consciousness than it did 100 years ago, probably. Yeah. I mean, so in the piece, he says that, you, you, that if you want to understand the Bolsheviks success you it, you can basically chalk it up to two to two characteristics one was its internal dynamism and democracy the other was the extent to which it was it had deep organic links within the russian working class and key industrial uh, centers and sectors i would say it would be hallucinatory to use vivek's word to imagine that the left um, has anything approaching that in, in the United States. The, you know, the extent of that, of that divorce or separation in uh, Western Europe, I think, is less extreme, but it's dramatic relative to the links that social democracy and communism had uh, to working class communities and working class life um, until the, the 1980s and, and and uh, maybe even mid 1980s. So. Yeah, and I think that the you can actually see the the inverse happening, um, whether it's UKIP uh, in Britain or whether it's Alternative for Deutschland in Germany or whether it's Jobbik in Hungary. A lot of uh, you know what's traditionally termed the the, wor- the traditional working class, right, uh, is now um, actually moving towards the right wing, uh, and especially the National Front in France is a very it's a right-wing, xenophobic, horrific party, but it's very different from the United States or even from Britain because it actually is trying to defend the welfare state, but only for native-born French people, right? So it's this, White people. Right, thank you. This mixture of essentially the, the socialists are not defending the welfare state, the National Front is, and what we want to do is make sure that these freeloaders and these immigrants who don't share our culture do not get to share in what we built as a nation, right, as working people in France. So our solution is a heron uh, which is another way to say racialized uh, social welfare state. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm afraid to go to go in that direction. Just because I, feel I don't like want to go in that I, direction. I, I, feel, I would not vote uh, for Le Pen. No, no. I mean, I'm afraid. I'm, af- <laughs> I'm afraid to go in the direction of discussing that, just because I feel like we have so much to um, to deal with just in these articles. But, yeah, sure. you know, yeah, I, fair I, enough. I, 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 we can I, get to it at the end, and yeah. I would also like to hear Sean's take in his own personal experience of being in the building trades yeah, and what yeah. that culture is like. Yeah, I think it is worth noting that, like, if 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 you if you track the the collapse of of social democracy. And by collapse, I mean its inability, or depending on your point of view, unwillingness, I would say inability to continue to deliver increases in people's well-being and and happiness and life expectancy and whatever social measures concern you. You track that and you see the, and you see the decline in the capacity to deliver to deliver the goods. You can also see um, the inverse of that, which is the which is the rise of powerful parties. Um, and movements of the far right. And I think, like, actually, you know, one, uh, one country that Sean didn't mention is Italy, and they went through this process maybe somewhat earlier and more dramatically than other countries because social democracy in Italy was so closely linked to the Third International, uh, the, the, uh, the, the Communist Party of Italy, which collapsed much earlier than the, than the, com- the total and complete capitulation of the rest of Western um, social, uh, social democracy did. So there you see the implosion of, the, of, of this entire political formation. And, and you want to know uh, when, when and how that happened for our listeners who might not know? Oh, yeah. Sorry. Um, the end of the Cold War. The, mm. the collapse of the Soviet Union. The PCI. Mm. Yeah. Um, spelled, uh, you know, resulted in pretty i don't know the exact date of the in the pci basically um but for but, but yeah. also for historical context too yeah. of all early of the, 90s of yeah. all the communist parties in europe uh the cpi coming out of the second world war and the resistance was the largest and in fact it took cia intervention to 
keep the Communist Party from being democratically elected, I think in 1948, uh, they had such a mass social base within that country. So to see them fall so precipitously and so quickly, uh, I think gets to another one of these um, issues you know, that, that we were talking about. Um, how can such a giant mass-based organization um, hollow itself out, be hollowed out, I should say, and have no solution um, when it comes to an era of uh, neoliberal recapitulation? So I think the central claim of uh, a Vivek's article can be summarized as, in, in his quote, our strategic perspective has to downplay the centrality of revolutionary rupture and navigate a more gradualist approach. For this foreseeable future, left strategy has to revolve around building a movement to pressure the state, gain power within it, change the institutional structure of capitalism, and erode the structural power of capital, rather than vaulting over it. This entails a combination of electoral and mobilizational politics. I mean, I, it actually seems almost self-evident to me, given the, the institutional weakness of the left, which is to say the weakness of our own independent organizations, given the limited nature of the, the sort of hard left, so to speak, the, the, to, the, our, our, our interaction and embeddedness within working class communities, workplaces, et cetera. And then also given the, I think, enormous and um, unexpected success of social democratic politics on, or you know, the electoral success of uh, social democratic pol uh, politics, certainly in, uh, the ang in the Anglosphere, in the English speaking world with, with Corbyn in the UK and uh, and Bernie here, and I lo I look at what the left I think about what the left looked like as I was coming of age in my late teens and my early twenties um, as a bun it, it was a bunch of tiny sectoids and you know or or you know puppet building and and anarcho performance groups <laughs> oh they love those puppets that like that 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 felt things very powerfully but was but but like could alienate a normal person within fit within. Oh, not 15 minutes, but 15 seconds. Definitely. I remember. But what we're seeing now is is the is the enormous appeal and attractiveness of certain core principles on the left that, you know, not least of which. And this one, I think, is one that is, is demonstrated itself to be very popular. Right. Is the idea that there are certain things that ought not be commodified and by commodified, I mean that, that ought not require income or currency or money to be able to acquire there are certain things that are that that are that are, that we that we that we see as so important that they're fundamental to being able to 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 meaningfully participate in modern life this stuff has shown itself to be deeply appealing to people in the absence of powerful institutions and parties it it seems to me that it would be an enormous missed opportunity to not attach our project to these larger electoral movements, and I think you know, and 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 I, I you know I understand the caution around it, um, and I think the you know the, obviously the other dimension you know of 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 this this sort of the strategy of the road to power is that yeah we have to be organizing in terms of mobilizational politics, mass movement politics. Yeah, clearly, we need to be organizing our own, maybe our, our, our own parties, certainly our own mobilizational capacity, which is a sort of jargony word that probably requires some explanation. But, but what I mean by that, we need to be building institutions, whether they be trade unions or, commu or, or community groups, that are capable of disrupting the status quo to the extent that they can impose costs on capitalism, businesses, the state, what have you, and actually be able to intervene with, certain, with, with some amount of agency. Yeah, yeah and just to, to branch off of that, I, I want to step back for one second and just talk about how capitalism is structured because what this ultimately comes down to is in my mind, and I think all the people here in the studio's mind, uh, this fundamental conflict between capital and labor, 
with the state as its mediation, right? Mm -hmm. I believe, and I think that all the empirical evidence shows, and uh, theoretically I think it's true, that there is class conflict, that it is always existing in the workplace, whether people are striking or in the streets, or whether they're quiescent and going about their day, there is a constant battle, right, between the owners of the means of production and the people who only have their labor power to sell. Now, if you look at that from that perspective, you see these episodic, as I think Chibber calls them, these episodic um, breaks with normality. You saw this uh, right when the crisis happened. I remember Republic Windows and Doors was a uh, In factory. Chicago, yeah. Yeah. And uh, they were going to close down the factory, and the workers occupied it, and they took it over. And they ended up getting, I think, a, a nice settlement or severance out of it. But they took direct action and they sat down on the shop floor. You saw later on, you saw Occupy Wall Street. Again, this episode that was uh, very dramatic and then petered out very, very quickly. You saw then, um, you know, the California student struggles. You saw um, recently the teacher strikes. You've seen all these sort of um, flashes in the pan. And I think to get back to what Chibber's talking about and what you're talking about is there has to be some sort of binding left institution that's able to take these moments of episodic mobilization and turn them into something that is able to have an institutional memory and also the capacity to connect these different struggles together. Or an institutional legacy. Forward. I mean, yes. forget about memory. I mean, that, 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 I think that's like... I think the bigger ask and the more important thing that, that we should that we should be trying to achieve as an institutional legacy of these various struggles is to figure out a way to take these small victories or struggles or moments of resistance and ensure that they leave some kind of impact that augments the 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 the, ba the balance of the, the balance of, of of forces. Yeah, I mean that's been my argument for this stuff as well, and it's part of why I joined the DSA um, because I think maybe around the time of Occupy I adopted sort of like an armchair leftist attitude about things maybe I was a little bit lazy uh, the political activism I saw going on around me was stuff that I couldn't really be a full participant in because I'm a coward and I don't want to get hurt or arrested um, and I wanted something that could like Occupy Wall Street was not going to abolish capitalism like that wasn't going to happen, but it did create a model for things we can do in the here and now as a blueprint for a more communal kind of society. So I think I took some of those lessons and I was like, what can we do now? And I really liked the way the DSA approaches this stuff um, because... I mean, we're going to get to Charlie Post in a little bit. He thinks that these things can't really coexist together, but it's kind of a more is more approach because the left is so beaten down at this point in time. We're just on our backs. Like, we got to try everything. We got to throw a bunch of stuff up at the wall and see what sticks. Or, you know, in a more, like, obviously a more strategic way than that. But, like, I think people don't realize that the DSA is essentially an anti-capitalist organization right now. It's changed a lot from what it was when it first started, and it was much more of a reformist, social democratic organization. Um, but now we really, most of us, I can't speak for everyone, but uh, most of the people that I've talked to in the New York branches are really coming from a horizon of actual socialism. But um, we also want to work with the realities that we have on the ground and know that most normal people, if you go up to them and say, oh, hey, we want to abolish private property, here's a pamphlet, they won't know what to do with that. But like we were talking about at a meeting the other night when we were talking about our current push for tenants, organiz tenants rights organization. If you go up to your neighbors and you say, hey, is there anything that could be better in this building? Isn't it fucked up how you have to give your landlord all your money and they're not doing anything for you in return? Like people will be responsive to that. So it's like it's like the tip of the spear in many ways. And it's training people, encouraging their impulses to ask for more and demand more and maybe the way most people understand politics is through electoralism, but maybe it's a gateway drug. And in that way, I think it could lead to more radical forms of organization down the line. Yeah, I, I couldn't I couldn't agree more. I, I, I would I would add to that. It may be the case that not only would it alienate people to talk to them about abolishing the commodity form or whatever, you know, your choice lingo is. 
it may be the case that we wouldn't know what to do if we abolished capitalism today. I mean, it. it oh, it, that's definitely true. Uh, We're, we need we we are working on it. We have a lot of work to do. Yeah, I and mean, I don't think we have to justify I mean, the, our specific plans in order to justify working to abolish capitalism. But you're right. I think I think that's fair. I mean, if if we if we say and the way you justify abolishing capitalism, right, is to say that there are certain um, there are certain ethical positions that we take that are incompatible with capitalism as far as we understand it. But it doesn't necessarily follow from there that capitalism's abolition, in the abstract, is going to solve all you know all all of these problems. And certainly, it won't. Not it doesn't follow that it would solve them without generating new and different and problems that are just as difficult. Yeah, I mean, it's a fair question, right? And, because and, we've and, seen some really bad examples in the past of things that have happened when people went from a capitalist system to something that was, you know, better in some ways and worse in others. I think most people, well, not most people, actually, most people in the world are suffering. But if you go up to, a, you know, an, a middle class American and you say, you know, we want this drastic rupture and it could, we don't have any specific plans. And, you know, a lot of times in the past, it resulted in humanitarian catastrophes, but we should do it anyway. And whatever, even without that, that just means asking people to incur quite a bit of risk. Yeah. Right. For for an for an outcome or a payout that is undefined and unclear and unpredictable. And I you know this I th I think that like I I don't think this is the only sort of defense of um, what I maybe we'll call today uh, gra gradualism or whatever. Um, but it's also there, there's also a practical defense of gradualism because all of this is sort of a moot point because we're so far from the political a political position in which these sort of d demands can seem anything short of absurd, right? And so, and so w what we as socialists, I think, and I, and I, and I, and I, 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 I feel as I'm following uh, Vivek Chibber here, want to be doing is thinking about building institutions, fighting for reforms that transform the terrain of battle for future struggles, and in doing so, also ameliorate basic kinds of suffering today. Yeah, like, that's the other thing. Like, I'm sort of, at this point, after reading both of these pieces, I'm somewhat agnostic on the idea of social democracy as a definite route to actual socialism. But what it is a definite route to is saving lives and alleviating suffering. And I think that alone is a good enough reason to do it. Vivek doesn't dwell on it. But somewhere in, early in the, in, in the article, he talks about... 20th century socialist relationship to liberal political values, that the legacy of Stalinism was really damaging to us, particularly because of the way that it dismissed these emancipatory liberal principles and resulted in, in, in sorts of oppression that, that, we, that we have to reject. But it's also important, and this is where it relates to this sort of ameliorative uh, dimension of social democracy, we need to remind people that it was socialists that were the, that were the people that, and, and working class movements that won these, the, these, these, hard, these hard fought liberal rights and that have been at the vanguard of everything from racial equality to gender equality. Yeah, and, and, and people the, and even the, to the left of socialists, like anarchists. Like, do you like only having, well, I say only, like that was never the horizon, but do you like having to only work 40 hours a week? That mm -hmm. is because people far more radical than most of us living today fought and died for this stuff. Sure. The folks that brought you the weekend, as the, yeah. uh, as the FLCIO <laughs> says. So, and yeah. like even liberal reforms that most left liberals would be in favor of, these happen because of movements much further to the left of them that scare the shit out of the ruling class and convince them to make these reforms, these compromises. Concessions, right, yeah. yeah. See, this is where I want to push back. Uh, I have several places I want to push back on Chibber. But um, the first place oh, I want to push back is um, at a certain point in time, Chibber talks about this uh, electoral strategy, right? He talks about getting involved in building the policy the legislative, the institutional, uh, political power within the bourgeois state in order to make future struggles more likely to succeed. So what he essentially seems to me to be implying, and this might be a bad faith uh, read, but 
this is what I got from it, is that the base for a socialist transformation of society will come actually from the top down electorally uh, and also come from a cadre group that is both external but also interacting and embedded uh, with the working class. And so my pushback on that is if you look at the grand sweep of, let's just say, U.S. history, and this I think holds for almost all advanced capitalist countries, I think Chibber makes a common mistake that a lot of progressives and a lot of uh, democratic socialists and others make, which is where they put the cart before the horse, right? I think that when you've seen real improvements, as Jamie said, in the lives of people, uh, both in terms of policy and politics, but also in terms of power in the shop floor, power in communities, and powers, power in the streets, it has been for most of history, you've seen it uh, as in these periods where the working class writ large uh, is engaging in self-activity, which is to say that conditions become ripe, all right? There are, there's a militant minority that comes out of these conditions uh, that pushes forward along with millions of other people um, a radical, not rupture with capitalism per se, but a rupture with the status quo and starts directly confronting capitalist social relations on every single front. And you saw this in the 19, you saw this in the 1870s in the United States, you saw this in the 1930s in the United States, and you saw this in the 1960s and 70s in the United States, right? We could potentially, within this cycle of struggles, as they say, st we could be seeing a return to a moment of worker self-activity. And by that, by workers, I mean the pro proletariat. You know, I mean pink collar, I mean white collar, I mean blue collar, I mean black, Service industry. white, oh, every, every industry, right? People whose backs are against the wall right now in this time of crisis. Yeah, union, non-union. You saw this in uh, West Virginia, Oklahoma. Uh, teachers are now in strike in Arizona, right? Mm -hmm. I do believe. Um, these are very, these are very, very small blips, right? But I just want to caution uh, all of us here, and um, you know the people who are uh, sympathetic to to Chibber to not put the cart before the horse because I think that when the working class uh, engages in self-organization and self-activity, that is ultimately what makes, what allows these gains to come through uh, in the political sphere. Yeah, I mean, a phrase I've seen bandied about is that it's a trailing indicator of social forces, which is good, I think, descriptive of what I'm trying to say. I mean, we had a caller the other day who uh, sort of caricatured my views, uh, to to say to to paint a picture where I think electoral politics don't matter at all, and he like he he brought up the example of abortion because he knows I care about that, saying well, you know if the Supreme Court overturns Roe versus Wade, uh, it doesn't matter. There can be all the protests in the world, and you're still not going to be able to get an abortion. And I was like, do you think that is the only way that we get rights? A, do you think that's the only way that we get rights in America? Do you think these Supreme Court decisions are created in a vacuum? You know, they pretend that they are, but they're really not. And also, like, I don't think, like, holding up the fact that this right now hangs in the balance, right, and that the Democratic Party has done a piss-poor, terrible job of protecting it through the decades since we were, you know, quote-unquote granted this right by a Supreme Court decision it's not evidence of the legitimacy of that system. If anything, I'd say it's evidence that this system is not equipped to protect our rights in any way. That is. Jamie, I really, I really agree with that. Sean, I mostly agree with what you said. I mean, in that, like... I'll take it. Yeah. I mean, I'm, 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 really, I'm really just instinctively sympathetic with the position that you, that, that, that you're, that you take. And I think that most of the socialists I know are committed to some version of what we call in the small socialist left in the United States some kind of socialism from below, right? Um, and obviously, we want our organizations um, and our militants to be developing the sorts of rank-and-file struggles that can generate sort of larger waves of organic participation in radical politics. But it's also the case that the that this the Bernie moment and the Corbyn moment 
taught us that there's a lot of sympathetic left sentiment out there, and I think it would be foolish to not capitalize on that. What's more, I think it demonstrates an opportunity and a strategy through which we can use electoral politics instrumentally, not just to fight for reforms and win, and, and win important positions within the capital state, but also to use these campaigns, given the centrality of electoral politics in American political life, to evangelize, to organize, and to fight. Um, and just, a you know, I, I, and this may be a controversial, God, it's like I'm courting controversy. Go now. ahead. Give me um, <laughs> uh, We're ready. You know, I don't feel like it's a controversial position to take, but I think we should, like, I think looking at Venezuela is a sort of interesting place to start. You, you know, Chavismo, yeah, you want to you want to summarize a little bit what's going on in Venezuela. I, I I'll talk. I, I mean, that's what I'm going to talk about Venezuela right now, just for a moment. I think is a really interesting case. Um, this is a this the 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 Chavista project, Quinta Republica now PSUV. You know, seems to be something that's maybe maybe failing, maybe collapsing. I I'm not really. I don't think we have time to get into that. But one thing that's very interesting is that this was at its peak a mass-based working class and lump and, and also lumpen proletarian movement, liberatory movement, anti-capitalist movement that was initiated essentially from the top in that the in, in, in that as a result of signals from the the commanding heights of Venezuelan politics, the presidency people were pulled into action and activity in really, really impressive ways. And what you see is, well, what you saw was a project, I think, not terribly different from, like, the American Civil War, even, where you have this, this, this except that you have a majority of the population rather than a minority, that um, gains access to full citizenship for the first time. And whatever becomes of Maduro and his government these people are not going to disappear and in, 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 into history again. They're here to stay. And politics and citizenship and, and participation have been, if not permanently, then certainly temporarily transformed. And I'm not saying this is the model we should follow. I'm just saying this, uh, that, 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 that Chavismo was an, was an example of a very participatory, democratic, organic, uncontrollable, certainly at the, at, 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 on the street level, movement that was at least initiated by an electoral project that appeared very top-down and didn't have real deep roots in the working class. And I don't think we should follow that, but I think only th th that, we, that we should take these, these things quite seriously. And if right now this Bernie thing is going to happen in, in 2020, this is a really, really good opportunity to get the the... the the, the 60,000 or 20,000 socialists that, that aren't quite cadre yet, but that could be, that, that, but, but that could be knocking on people's doors, talking to them about our vision of society in the short run, our, our, our goals for society in the long run, and, of course, the things that we can deliver immediately. It's not clear that every model of progress is going to be one that's optimal with respect to our, our ideological and political commitments. But it seems to me in this moment of incredible weakness and incredible uncertainty, we ought not shy away from potential opportunities. And you know, whatever, whatever the perils of electoral particip participation are, and of course there are many, and we've seen left movements, radical oppositional movements subsumed within sort of and normalized within electoral projects we're too weak and too marginal to not take advantage of this opportunity to participate in mainstream american life or mainstream life within the context of whatever nation we're considering and and that's the basic uh, that's the basic t take home i would like people to that that's that's fair i, I think that's a, a very reasonable point i think that what really that points to right is this difference between means and ends so 
the huge difference between Chibber and Post is uh, what they envision the horizon to be, the telos, what we are working towards. So, Jamie, you had a question regarding one part of the Chibber piece, right? Yeah. I mean, I don't disagree with anything you've said so far, really, and I don't disagree with a lot of what Chibber said. However, there were some parts that raised some red flags for me in terms of what his horizon actually is. And one of those parts was where he's stating like the basic principles we should be operating on. One, the market will be constrained so it isn't the arbiter of people's basic well-being. Two, economic decision makers will be democratically accountable. And three, wealth inequalities will not be allowed to translate into political inequalities. And this raised some red flags for me about what his horizon actually is because it seems to be conceding that we're still going to have markets and wage labor and bosses and wealth inequality, which will somehow not translate into political inequality, which I'm not sure how that's going to work. Um, and it makes me wonder what is even different about this model from capitalism. It sounds like a, a gentler, nicer version of capitalism, really. Or rather from like a, a very, very developed social democratic capitalism. I think it, I think it does several things, this, the, the, these bullet points. And I might, if, if I were writing this, I might not have done quite as good a job as Chibber did, but I might not have included, at least explicitly, the idea that there's a possibility that we're going to be, that, that we as socialists might want to defend a, a, a social formation that still includes uh, meaningful disparities in wealth. However, the idea here, I think, is that insofar as these might exist in some long transitional period, we would want as socialists and as people who are committed to popular power and democracy to limit the extent to which inequalities in, in property, effectively, um, can translate into inequalities in political power. There, like, there were a lot of memes over the last two years on Left Book about like full, oh, we com love memes, yeah. full communism and, and this sort of stuff. That's a real provocation. I, and, and, and they were like cats and shit. But like, <laughs> frankly, like, we're, we are in no position. cats. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, we, we, we're, in, we're in no position to make any claims about a world with, 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 without, without work, without at least some, some of the, the formal institutional structures that we associate with capitalism. Even, a tr even, even, even like, I said er pretty early on that I basically agreed with Vivek Chibber's assessment of a revolutionary socialist strategy as being hallucinatory. But even in, even, even in a revolution, even in a post-revolutionary situation, it's hard for me to imagine an immediate transition to a world in which hierarchies and certain markets are at least immediately abolished. And, and, and given, given our, current, our, our current position of power, and just assuming for the moment that we're all in agreement, which I don't think we are, that some gradualism is going to be required at least before a more, a more major uh, trans transition begins. Obviously, we're just we're we're we're, we're going to want to push and fight for reforms. Op on the one hand, transform the conditions of struggle, but on the other hand, help realize our ethical vision, and I of of of. of how human beings ought to interact with society. Okay, and this is where I'm going to push back on you a bit mm -hmm. out of comradely love. Mm -hmm. um, you, you talk about um, ethics, and I do believe that that is a strong reason why all of us are here in this room and doing this podcast, right? Ultimately, without there actually being socialism, you can only have an ethical commitment to a world beyond capitalism at this moment in time. That said, um, we also have to look at things structurally. Right. Because we're all also here well versed in our marks. I would argue actually the flip side of that. Uh, and I would actually concede to you that, yes, in the in the short term and maybe the medium term. Right. It is the push for the decommodification of very important parts of human life. It is the push for getting the bourgeois state off our backs enough that we have the room to move around. Right. And we have the, the room to basically act as a working class in motion. But 
I think actually what's unrealistic to me about the, the Vivek Chibber vision of the horizon, because you also saw the horizon as a temporal horizon. In my mind, the horizon does have a temporal aspect to it, but it's also about what you are ultimately fighting yeah, for. It's the end goal. That's which... in, in my mind, it's the end goal. And so if you look at the, the grand sweep of capitalist history and we're not going to get through it today obviously but just to really summarize things right if you want to create a world like vivek chibber imagines right and that you are hesitantly uh, agreeing with right in the in the medium term right cautiously sure cautiously yeah. you have to grapple with the history of capitalist society and especially in the united states you have to look at the history of social democracy, such as it was in this country. Not social just in the democracy, United States, right? Yeah, like all of these but, great social democracies in Europe are now being squeezed by austerity because the upper limit is not what people can imagine. It's the market and the vicissitudes of yes, the market. Yes, exactly. And, and, and I want to stick with the United States only because it's the one I know the most. But you're right. Uh, the vicissitudes of the market have, have turned this Scandinavian model, right, which everyone talks about, oh, Denmark, Sweden, Norway, this is what you know, we want as progressive uh, democratic socialists, right? That's our, our end goal. Um, if you look at just the United States, you had a period of 50 years. You know, I'd go from, let's say, 1936 or 34 to 1981, right, with Reagan smashing Patco. You had this golden age of not only capitalist accumulation, but also of social democratic rights such as they were in the United States, okay? So the best that you got from massive working class struggles, sit-down strikes, uh, general strikes, secondary boycotts, right, radicals in the unions, the best you got out of that was 50 years of a relatively watered-down social democratic state where these institutions were put up the unions and the democratic party that represented labor as wage labor they represented working people as in a very instrumental way whether that was through collectively bargaining or whether that was through their voting capacity right as essentially the working class being an instrument for this bureaucracy to maintain its power okay that's what remains of the labor movement right now. So that said, that happens in a period when growth rates in the United States were almost unprecedented, between 4 and 8%. Now you have growth rates that are between negative 1% and 2% uh, in the United States. And worse, in Europe and in Japan, they've been zero for about 30 years. So I'm not sure, without, without actually expropriating the capitalist class, where you're going to find the money, where you're going to find the ability, where you're going to find the structural power in order to get to gain these social democratic that, that, things that you yeah. want. That's, that's, that's the structural post argument. I mean, this that's all fine to me. I like I, I, I base I, I buy I buy your account. I think this is precisely why it's so important to study very seriously the limits and, and, and the failures of really existing social democracy just like we want to look at the failures and limits um, and, 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 and horrors of really existed socialism. Sure. Now, I, and, I, but I, we live in really existing capitalism, of, of, and you recognize of, of, that of, as yeah, well as anybody yeah, else. Of course we do. Yeah. And, 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 and I think that like, the, like a discussion of growth rates, which are something that with respect to our own agency, even our collective agency as the left, is something that's largely out of our hands. Obviously, I agree with you that it's the case that we don't, you know, that, that we don't struggle under conditions of our own choosing. And a famous guy said that once. Sure. Beardo, beardo weirdo. Yeah. yeah. And OK, so I think I, I think I think we're already in Charlie Post territory yeah. here. And obviously, we don't struggle under conditions of our of our own choosing. And, so, and, and, and in many respects, they're not of our own making. And an age of slow growth tending towards stagnation, which may or may not be on the horizon, um, I think limits our organizational and, and mobilizational capacity in meaningful ways because the risks associated with revolt and organization are increased when you can't just take this job and shove it and go somewhere else. Right. However, I think that, that like our mobilizational and organizational capacity is structurally bound. 
and we need to operate within those bounds when we talk about what is and what is not realistic. Certainly the abolition of the capital, of, of capital or whatever isn't realistic at this moment. So the question is what sorts of reforms, what sorts of, of minor victories can augment the, 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 condition, the, the conditions of our political participation in ways that are advantageous to us? Mm. And always these things are going to generate unintended consequences and, 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 and new questions, new, prob new problems, what have you. But... Well, listen, I'll, I'll but, tell but, you this. But, but social democracy is probably the limit of our immediate horizon. And I'll say this, well, that one of the unintended consequences of you fighting for, of, of, I'm sorry, not you, I don't want to make this personal, but people fighting for social democracy might be that because of growth rates, because of crisis of capital accumulation, one of the unintended consequences of, of us fighting for social democracy is we might end up in socialism. Because if the system structurally is not able to mm -hmm. bear our demands, they actually go from not from non-reformist reforms actually into revolutionary ones if it actually causes a ruptural break. Yeah, I mean, that's something that I was going to bring up, too. And I think it's something we also talked about with Ross Wolf, um, that social democracy only works when profit rates are high enough for there to be profits on top of whatever they're giving to the workers. And uh, I think... We've seen from the most of the 20th century that this was an anomalous period in history, if nothing else. But I sure. wanted to go back a little bit, too, mm -hmm. and talk about um, the idea of what's realistic and what, her what the horizon should be or what it means. Um, and maybe I'm trying to have it both ways, but I really think uh, all the stuff that Chibber sets forth as a horizon is good in the short to medium term. But also, I think as leftists, we have to be optimistic. We have to be hopeful. We have to be pushing ourselves and others always, always to envision a horizon beyond what feels realistic to us right now. Because we all grew up in this world. We all exist in this world. Um, and this is one of neoliberalism that is constantly rendering itself normal and invisible to us. Even those of us who believe in something more and think we can go further so uh, like yeah. if if we were to have the amount of class power that it's going to take to even get to the social democratic horizon i don't see why we shouldn't use that momentum to keep on going forward and go the rest of the way there because history has shown that um it's never going to last but you know profit rates will fall capital will come back on us and we're going to end up right back where we were in the 80s yeah so i i I, I, I think I mostly agree with you. I just don't know if we have a clear idea of where the, well, so to speak, the, the there is there that we're trying to get. And I, you know, I, and I want to be clear here just on a personal note. Like, I, I'm not terribly um, sympathetic um, when it comes to uh, these market socialist visions. However, I do think that we have to be honest with ourselves that – we don't have a political plan, and we certainly don't have an economic plan when it comes to what um, what 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 socialism or an egalitarian political economic order necessarily necessarily looks like. Um, and I think that all of these critiques around I just want to go back to your first point around the dependence of robust social democracy on um, high profit rates, and I think in many people's minds will be the export dependence of um, Scandinavian social democracy, the sure. most advanced and most just and most humane form of social democracy, probably the most humane social formation that the world has ever seen. Having a bunch of oil in Norway doesn't hurt either. And, and or, you know, in the case of Sweden, you know, an incredibly productive, capital-intensive, export-oriented... Yeah, and um, a history of imperial plunder throughout the world, right? I don't know if they were very dependent on uh, that. They may, have right. been, they may have been beneficiaries yeah, of... of some other countries yeah, massive, in Europe. Massive uh, yeah. but like, uh, social democratic Like, the very uh, idea struggle. that, like, the, you know, the Bernie Kratt model is based on is based on us being the richest country in the world. And, like, that involves other countries being poorer countries in the world. Yeah. And, like, I... I don't think you can do that and internationalize it for that very reason. I don't want to get bogged down in that, but I, it, it, to me, it's not, it, it's, not, it's not absolutely clear that the, that the rich countries on earth are rich, and rather capital rich, 
like high, have high capital to labor ratios simply as a result of some zero-sum mercantilist competition with the, with, um, with the rest of the world. I don't, it's not clear to me that the wealth of the U.S. or the U.K. or Germany is the result in the long run of net, of net transfers. I think that most of this development is endogenous, is the result of capitalist development within and around uh, these societies. But that said, I do, I do take your point very seriously, you know, that, that, that the welfare state, if that is the main form of social democracy, if that's the horizon of social democracy that we're considering, is obviously dependent on capitalist profits. National capitalist profits. Yeah, sure, this sure. is a You're, point that Charlie the, Post the, makes very it, well, I think, exactly. of the structural limitations. And, 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 and I don't think, I don't think that, that, that Vivek Chibber would disagree with that. In fact, I, I, you know, I, he teaches this in his in his his intro class or, or or whatever, but I think that this raises important questions about the nature of reform. You know, there are references to the Meidner Plan or whatever, and, and this is a pretty good example of a social demo, a radical social democratic reform that is, um, you know, that that requires a really dynamic and healthy capitalist sector in order to, 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 to drive it forward. And expropriate it. Exactly. But it's also an example of really interesting, innovative thinking, and the sort of thinking that the socialist left needs to take very seriously, to look at the opportunities, to look at the openings, and to, fi and, and, and to find ways to maximize our power to impose reforms that, that change the, the structure of political competition. So just after the crisis, 2007, 2008, there were a number of financial institutions, auto manufacturers that were effectively bailed out by, um, by, by, the, by the American government, by the, by the government of the United Kingdom, and they were, for all intents and purposes, under public ownership. What was interesting is that in all of these cases, they weren't. They were. They were publicly owned, but they weren't subject to public control. And it was. It's a, it was. A, it was a really interesting moment, that I think if it were to happen again today, we may be, We might have been in a position, to treat it very differently. To say, look, insofar as as as, as these, important, financial, economic, productive institutions, exist as a result of an influx of capital, that is ours. Ours collectively. What happened in, in 2007, 2008 in the crisis that you're talking about uh, in the auto industry and also with the banks was a bipartisan, as we remember, project, right? Uh, and I think it showed at that point in time something that Chibber does a, a good job of pointing out, which is that this has been a crisis of neoliberalism, the neoliberal model of capitalism, not capitalism itself. You had a bipartisan, which means the Democratic Party, right? Uh, Barack Obama fam famously, right, uh, helped to push through that package to bail out the banks, to, to, mm -hmm. to bail out the auto industry, right? I think that the point is well taken that uh, uh, we swim in the waters, you know, we, we work within the conditions, political, economic, uh, that we are given. And I do, despite all my pessimism about what you're saying in terms of you know, social democracy and reformism and electoralism, I do think that we are in a very unique place right now to start pushing things in certain directions. More space than I've seen in the over two decades that I've spent on the left. Yeah, I mean, the example you brought up of Barack Obama um, kind of points to another, uh, another reason why I think a lot of the time liberals and leftists are talking past each other, which is that when I talk to a left liberal about this stuff, they often have an idealist vision of the problems of the world and the problems of capitalism. You know, people have become too materialist. Uh, these politicians Not have the lost Marxist their... Not in the Marxist way. In the yeah, too, too materialistic. <laughs> uh, these politicians have lost their way, and they've forgotten what they stand for. And um, Capitalists are taking stock buybacks we, because they're greedy. Yeah, because they're just greedy. And if we can all just remember our good old-fashioned New Deal values we can return to a more equitable society. And I do not agree with that, as I don't think anyone in this room does. Um, and I got to give Barack Obama a little more credit, actually. Did he capitulate to neoliberalism because he went from being a good person to a bad person? 
No, I think he bumped up against the structural limitations of what his bourgeois political party would allow within the context of this time and place in within capitalism. Sure. Um, so these are structural limitations that are material. They're real and they cannot be overcome simply by having quote unquote better politics you or heard better this, values. You heard it first here, folks. Barack Obama was an object of history, not a subject. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think people have uh, an inflated view of the types of power that people like presidents have to, uh, you know, create change on their own to influence much of anything. You know, like the New Deal, going back to that, it's not something that FDR did for the American people because he was nice and be or because, you know, the right politicians got voted in. It was the result of massive amounts of class struggle trickling up and not the other way around. Well, Asher had an interesting third way to talk about, um, like, anarchist interstitial shit. Maybe we should end on that. Um. Yeah, I, 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 you know, it, it strikes me, given that at least the terms of this debate rely on some ideas that have their origin um, with uh, a man named Eric Olin Wright, who, as far as I know, I think coined the term ruptural politics to describe the sort of revolutionary road to socialism. And he, he, uh, he uses another term uh, that he sort of uh, clunky and clumsy called interstitial to describe um, the process by which radicals build institution, institutions in the interstices or in the spaces left over um, uh, within, a, within a, a, any major social formation. Um, and I think, I, I think this, I would argue actually this, that this will ought to, I mean, and maybe I would say will play an important role in any future transformational project. And so, you know, there, there, we, we typically associate this sort of political activity with contemporary anarchism. Right. But I think if you look at its, at its, at its history, you know, this is, you know, this, this was one of the mobilizational strategies of the German Social Democratic Party, one of its most effective, building gymnasiums and choir yes. groups and um, worker theater companies and what have you. And, uh, you know, in the United States, there are really impressive examples of cooperative housing um, and, and buyers cooperatives and, and, and you know... Granges. And, and, yeah, and, and insurance groups and, and you know, yeah. uh, credit unions, et cetera. And to me, you know, when I think about how do how do we how do we build like both both Vivek and Charlie, and, and both both Chibber and Post agree in the necessity of rooting any anti-capitalist struggle in the you know in and around the laboring classes, the poor, the exploited, and and, and most importantly the people that are capable, given their objective position in our society, in bringing. Bring, bringing our, our country, our world to a, gr to a grinding halt to impose their demands in, uh, on, on society. That's right, the universal and, class. And, 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 and so it's really important to think about, you know, how, how, do, how, do we, how do we as socialists, as radicals, as people committed to an egalitarian, liberatory, democratic future make inroads into, play, into a place that we are not currently, that, we are not, that, that, we're, that we're not? We're on campuses, we're, 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 we're isolated in coastal cities, how do we make inroads there? Well, well, one way, and it's not the only way, but one, but, but one way that, sh that ought to play some role is building institutions, however minor, and in some cases they'll be costly, and this is, you know, this is why it, there's always trade-offs, but building institutions that benefit people, either materially in the form of money, but also benefiting people in terms of g giving people community, giving people voice, Allowing people to feel as though they are participating meaningfully in their own in their own lives in their own communities, and prov and providing people institutions that help develop a, um, a you know a, a a collective ethos and a collective ideology, and also shield people from the market in important ways. I mean, if you think about like the conservative commitment to the family, which is largely regressive, right? But it's also anti-capitalist in certain important respects true, because, yeah. it, because it represents the, 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 these non-market forms of exchange 
that w- w- that 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 are good, that are based on ethics, that are based on duty. You know, and 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 there so was a, the conception that arose in the late nineteenth century of uh, Victorian motherhood, and it arose in very very uh, in a very under very capitalist auspices because it imagined for the first time as the woman not being part of the household economy, but instead as being this nurturing agent that not only raises the kids and does all the social reproductive work uh, while the breadwinner is out you know, making the money so that the family can survive, but also, as you say, cultivating you know, the, the woman in, in this uh, marriage, cultivating um, basically a shelter from the storms of competition from the storms of uh, wage labor, from the storms, uh, the sturm and drang of uh, the day-to-day work environment, right? So the family was seen as this sort of buttress against all these market forces, even though, of course, it's very much imbricated w- within the market itself, right? But this was the ideology that arose. I think the interstitial argument is, is, a, is an interesting one because it does point to another way. And perhaps it is in the way that we ultimately get to the end goal, but it is, in a sense, an ameliorative, as they say, um, process and goal. But I want it to be that, instrumental. Yeah. Not, it, just, not just to me, because we, yeah. we, we should pursue these things not just because they're good, but because they're strategically important. Yeah. yeah. Well, well that, that's a, that, that, I mean, that's Post fair. talks about ameliorative versus oppositional politics. And a thought that just popped into my head when we were talking about the family was um, why not expand that space to include all of society? You know, like um, if the family currently, I mean, we know that it wasn't actually a space safe. The state as as the state as mother central planner. Why not? (laughs) Mom knows what's up. No, like Barbara Bush knows what's up. She could be our (laughs) everyone's mom. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Nothing wrong with that. Um, What was I saying? Oh, yeah. So. You know, we know the family is not actually a, sa- a space that is safe from capitalism, right? It is. Uh, and in fact, a lot of these social democratic reforms that we saw during the New Deal were predicated on women staying at home and doing the work of social reproduction. The, the payment for which was somewhat built in to the wage of their yes, husbands. That's right. right? Yep. Um, and now we're seeing this breakdown more and more the work of social reproduction is being shifted onto individuals as this infinite free gift that they're just supposed to be giving to capital. You know, women have to work, men have to work. We depend on each other for survival still, but, uh, you know, it's not really that much better. I mean, it's, it's, I like being allowed to work outside of the home, but that's once again, not the horizon I see for myself as a woman and as a feminist. So maybe we can take the good things about the family that, you know, maybe we're partially imaginary, maybe not, and try to expand them to include all of society in our families. Because you know, you mean you mean like things like uh, like like free, high quality child care, um, parental leave. Um, I was thinking more yeah. like pass the butter and they don't charge <laughs> you for it. I mean, if you just think <laughs> to, pass where, the hammer. <laughs> to where to where the nuclear family even came from and to where the origins of women's oppression are, you know, this is not endemic to humanity. And one thing I really like about Marx and Engels is they really were grappling with this stuff from the beginning. They wanted to know where it came from and they wanted to know the materialist basis for it. And as it so happens, the materialist basis for women's oppression comes from private property. That's right. Because as soon as you had private property, you wanted to know who your kids were so you could pass it down to them and have this like very individualistic proprietary model Whereas in hunter-gatherer societies, there was much less of a concrete idea of whose parents were whose and whose kids were whose. And people all just had sex with each other as a way of forming social bonds. And they raised the kids collectively. And like, like everyone I've talked to who has kids, and you could jump in, Asher, too, if you have thoughts, like you're not supposed to do this by yourself. Like it takes a village. That's a proverb for a reason. So <laughs> hopefully... Looking forward, HRC, could... revolutionary uh, anti-capitalist social reproduction theorist. 
That was a book she wrote. It takes a village. Mm-hmm, I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> cit- citation needed. Uh, so maybe looking ahead, I mean, I've, I still want to know who my kids are probably. And, you know, luckily I will because I'm a woman. But uh, I might not know. We would, I, I would like to see us return. Th- th- this, this realm of social reproduction could be turned into a site of radical radical struggle i yeah i i, I absolutely agree I, I with think you that I, I think it's that, well within the horizon of social democracy it's though, something still. it's something that needs to actually be politicized right and this is something that we saw with the women's movement for the last 60 70 80 years is the politicization of what was supposed to be not only not political but also not e- economic which is what's very important about the marxian concept of social reproduction is because it brings that back into the realm of understanding how people continue to be able to work, raise families, and make new generations under the auspices of capitalist uh, exploitation. And I I would say, Asher, going way back to the the point you said before, I think that there's a a very interesting sort of uh, historical dichotomy that exists um, between this conception of overthrowing capitalism, which is primarily you know, a political project, or if you were a syndicalist, you know, an economic process with the general strike. Um, But then there was also, as you were alluding to, this uh, sense of uh, overgrowth instead of overthrow, right? That you would create on the ground for a ameliorative, but also for uh, revolutionary purposes, the sorts of institutions and structures on the ground within trade unions, within communities, um, within um, cities, municipalities, right? Soviets. Soviets, thank mm-hmm. you. That could actually take the place and in their, in their own way decommodify uh, these different aspects of life. You mentioned, uh, you know, choral groups and stuff, right? But uh, the Knights of Labor, which was the first national uh, labor union in the United States, had an all-encompassing vision of what it was to be a labor union and re- represent working people. It had literacy programs. It had education when before public education was a thing. It had its own social welfare programs. It had death benefits, its own newspapers, its own leisure activities, you know, with picnics and outings and stuff like that within the union. It had its own court system where you could basically be brought up on charges and be judged by a jury of your working peers. Uh, And it even went so far as having its own standing militias that every Sunday would come together with their rifles, you know, back from the Civil War, and they would basically march rank and file uh, as working people in the Knights of Labor uh, militia, right, getting prepared to self-defend themselves. And so I think that this really points to a, a real tension, but also a third way around a lot of what we're talking about. Maybe it's just ameliorative. Maybe it's just a way that we could have a better life through, you know, cooperative apartments or land trusts, whatever the case may be. But it is entirely possible that as capitalism continues to remain in crisis, as ecology uh, gets worse and worse, as people are more and more pushed and work harder and harder, that uh, it is it is these structures that we create uh, that could be the seeds for this potential future, which, as you said, we don't have a plan for right now. Um, and that's actually sounds very anarchist, but in a sense, it's very Marxist, right? Because it's not communism isn't something that we dream up, right? It's the actual it's the movement of the uh, praxis, the abolition of the present state of things. One thing I wanted to tease out a little bit in the post piece is when he sets up electoral politics as being in opposition to mass movements, because I think um, like my ideology and the stance of the DSA and I think a stance that Asher's taking, too, is like we need both sort of a more is more approach. You know, we can work in in some sort of coordinated coalition with each other to fight on all these different fronts at once and um, always push things forward and one thing post does is he sets these up in opposition to one another and he says that electoral politics aren't necessarily bad but we can't use the same old capitalist political parties because that kind of left movement will always be subsumed in something like the democratic party no matter what your intentions are at the beginning because of those very structural limitations Um, and i just want to know if you guys think he's talking about 
so what what do you do with that? Is he talking about running as a third party? Because um, I feel like that historically, well, you know, you can you can find some examples in history of a party taking over and kicking another one out, like the Whigs. But like that hasn't happened in a really long time. And we do have a two party system in the U.S. And it's hard to imagine seizing any kind of electoral power without somehow interacting with the Democratic Party in places where it's very heavily entrenched, like New York. Like, I just voted to endorse uh, Julia Salazar, who is running in, an, in a Democratic primary in New York City, and she's a DSA comrade, and she is a socialist, and she, you know, her policies, her policy proposals might look a lot like Cynthia Nixon's, but they're coming from a very different horizon. Um, and it just sounds like, and, and we've also seen some resolutions from more radical members who are saying, you know, we should not interact with the Democratic Party in any way, shape, or form. And um, I think part of the misunderstanding is um, different people understand political economy differently, um, even people on the left. And I just wanted to get your take on that, babe. Sean, you're a babe. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Like, why are electoral politics in opposition to mass movements necessarily? And, like, why should we bother with third parties? I wouldn't say that they're, they're in opposition necessarily. I think it comes back to a conception and, a, and an idea that you were trying to push on the, I think, majority report the other day, which is that we're all, we're, we remain a militant minority. We remain a relatively small group of people on the far left who want to uh, imagine a world beyond capitalism. That being said, because we're not that many people, we only have so much energy and time to devote to things. So the argument is not that there isn't a push and pull between what happens in the electoral sphere and what happens within mass movements. For me, the issue is we as radical leftists who want to overthrow uh, the value for <laughs> overcome the value form right where do we put our time and energy into again voting doesn't take that long it doesn't take that much energy um i don't think canvassing for candidates is a good use of our energy really right if people want to do that that's fine but there is a relationship, but I just don't see why we should be spending uh, our time not only organizing around it, but even fretting about it. I think a lot of it is really gaslighting people on the far left into circumscribing what the idea of politics actually is. Politics can happen on the shop floor and be way more important than what happens in the electoral booth, right? Uh, politics can happen on the streets and have way more impact in the course of a two or three days than it could have in the course of a uh, six-year senatorial uh, term. So I just, I, I don't think you disagree with me, Jamie, because you made the same point. I don't think that electoral politics are unimportant. I just, I'm just not sure how much time we should really put into organizing around them. It's really, uh, it's a graveyard. Well, is it too kubaya of me if I suggest that... Uh Different people can focus on different things, different people with it's different not. strengths and different interests. It's not yes, kumbaya. It's, it's too kum it, it is. All right. Astra <laughs> says it's too kumbaya. I would say that just as capitalism sets up a uh, detailed division of labor within the workplace, if we imagine that um, we are on the far left of uh, the possible left in the United States, we can allow people whose vision is just social democracy who are just Bernie Kratz to do all the fucking work in the world they want to to get justice Democrats elected. That's all well and good. Maybe we can convince some of them to come on our side. That's fine, right? But let them do their thing and we'll do our thing. I'm convinced that ultimately we will be more successful because uh, direct action gets the goods. But browbeating people because they hold a particular faith in electoral politics isn't going to get you anywhere. Just like going to a fucking protest and having an RCP newspaper and yelling to people about the new synthesis of Baba Vakian isn't going to convert people to fucking radical left politics. I mean, I, I think it's worth maybe moving towards closing this out um, with a reminder that certainly, I don't know how people in this room feel, but it, I think it's certainly the case that both Charlie Post and Vivek Chibber seem to be in agreement uh, with the idea that some kind of internally coherent, formal 
party structure with cadre and and the ability to act politically in some unified form is necessary or likely necessary to transform society in meaningful ways, whether within a democratic, a social democratic horizon or a democratic socialist horizon. And I think that with respect to electoral politics, both of them, um, at, depending on the sort of the, 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 the temporal horizon we're considering, would probably agree that it should be looked at instrumentally. I think that uh, Tr Charlie Post takes uh, a much harder um, more fixed positions saying that like, you know, saying that socialists need to be, and I am being very cautious here, need to be very wary uh, insofar as they integrate their struggles and with, and with um, bourgeois parties, namely uh, the Democrats. And oh, I think, I think I, we should take the Republicans over, to be honest. But <laughs> that's that's my bourgeois party. I'm sure, sticking to it. Sure. Yeah. I mean, it's the par it's the party <laughs> oh, wow. of Lincoln, and and you know, the, and, and you know, our last great they, bourgeois revolutionary. Yeah. Wow, yes. The building trades have really changed you, babe. <laughs> real real oh, radical man. traditions. I learned that in the shanty. Well, but look, one of many things look, you learned in the shanty, if reports are to be believed. Boom, boom, bang, bang. I, my preference would be that when people are going and knocking on doors for Bernie in a few years, I think that there that that it's an opportunity for the radical left to be humble, to be thoughtful, to be open, to be reflective, and to be charming and to be charismatic and talk to people, find people, and relate to people. And at at, at the at the bare minimum, and I think that electoral politics has much more to offer than this. We ought to be engaging in electoral pol politics because at this moment, that is the place where it's most likely that we'll be able to reach out and make contact with many people. And, um, yeah. and I, think, I think it's a strategic, it, it, it would be strategically foolish. It would be arrogant, to, too. Yeah, yeah, we yeah. can't just be this revolutionary vanguard in our ivory tower, you know? And at the same time, we always have to be slow walking people and we always have to keep our horizon in mind. Like the other day, uh, on the majority report, uh, we Cynthia, Cynthia Nixon came up, right? She's running for governor. And, you know, Governor Cuomo, obviously bad guy, got to get him out. Um, but like as a far leftist, what I said was, you know, I will definitely vote for her. I will not canvass for her because, you know, my project is not exactly the same as hers. And I think my energy as a far leftist would be better spent elsewhere doing other things. Now, left liberals are welcome to do it. And I don't think they shouldn't. I think they should. And, you know, there are a lot of places where our programs overlap in terms of what progressive policies, policies we need to pass right now. Um, but we also have to keep in mind that our projects are not the same. And, you know, we can be friends. We can coordinate with each other and we can be fighting on different fronts at the same time. And I think Sam reacted pretty badly to that because he took that to mean that I was saying that nobody should be canvassing for Cynthia Nixon. And to him, you know, as a left liberal, that it, it's a very important project getting Cuomo out and getting someone more progressive in. And just by saying that I wouldn't do it on the show, I was discouraging other people from doing it. And he felt responsible for that. At the end of the day, he's responsible for what happens on his show. And on the one hand, I could say like, you know, kumbaya, we're all doing our own thing. But that's not entirely true, right? Because... Most people who have a strong ideology like we do want to spread it to the rest of the world, right? Otherwise, like, what's the point? What are we doing this for? So I, I can see it from both sides. You could, you could really spread that ideology if you're knocking on doors for... Uh, for Cynthia Nixon? For Cynthia Nixon, yeah, yeah. I mean, but, like, we do have to draw the line somewhere is also my point. Like, I don't think any reasonable person would argue that the DSA should be canvassing for Hillary Clinton, you know? So we have to have... A but, certain but, minimum level of rubric. I'm an accelerationist. Did. I'm an accelerationist, so I think they should be uh, knocking on doors for Trump in uh, 2020. <laughs> so we're going to close it out with this. Yeah, thing. yeah. So, like, I think this is actually a really good segue to talking about, like, how we make real political change in our workplaces every day on the ground. And Sean is like, you know, I work at a fucking podcast. Asher works at a leftist book publishing house. 
Sean is an actual union guy in the building trades and is probably in the best position of any of us to actually spread radical grassroots consciousness throughout the working class. Well, I mean, I'm in the best and also the worst position. I'm in the worst position because um, my default uh, <laughs> stance uh, for anybody that I work with is that they're inherently reactionary because we have so many people with really shitty politics within my union. And that, I think, really points to um, not only a, a split with the socialist left and the labor movement, but also how reactionary and right wing a lot of the white working class people uh, in this country have been, you know, have become in terms of Trump. But um, yeah, you know, I mean, I get sorry to interrupt. No, I get why uh, lots of people in the white working class hate the coastal elites. I get why they hate the fucking Clintons. I hate the Clintons, too. I do not get how it then follows that they would like this bloated, bitchy, oligarch, rich dude from New York with even worse policies for them. Well, I think that, you know, you talked about doing politics on a podcast and you don't have a union. As far as I know, Verso Books doesn't have a union, although I'm sure the uh, based on the parties I've been to, I'm sure the political conversations you have over at Verso are pretty lit. In the media world, I feel like um, a lot of people think that it's enough to merely spout leftish things on a <laughs> media platform and that that's their contribution to the struggle when ultimately I think the more important things that happen happen on the ground and they happen uh, because people with strong left beliefs um, are able to organize and work within their milieu oh, that that is definitely true and that's part of why i joined the dsa if i'm being frank about it because you know a lot of people have a lot of opinions in the political media and not a lot of people are out there on the ground living their principles and learning the important lessons that come from doing that like i don't trust anybody who's a pundit out there who wants to tell me what perhaps a, a a dead pundit uh, any any <laughs> proctologists, any pundits, <laughs> anybody out there who wants to tell me a live pundit, yeah, who, all all of them. Anybody who wants to tell me what I should be focusing my energy on or what my analysis should be, when sure you have a podcast that might reach you know a few thousand people, you might have a TV show where you get to bloviate about you know what shitty things this Republican did what Alex Jones did, how stupid Jordan Peterson is with the lobsters. Like that's all well and good. That's a certain form of kind of performative politics where you get to spout very moral positions on things and have the correct analysis here and there. Yeah, but, and I'm not saying that I'm like master organizer or anything, but no, I No, but you I put want, the fucking work I, in. I show up. You show up. That's why I think it's important that we separate people who claim to represent the working class from people who are actually embedded and work within the, yeah. the, that milieu. Yeah, even something as simple as like support. People have totally different ideas of what that means. You know, to one person, that might mean just like saying someone is good on the radio. And to another person, that might mean you actually go out and do something. And there's a lot of people out there, you know, who, who take very radical stance on things that happen in the international arena. arena. But when it comes to organizing at home, Oh, it's just vote for Democrats. This is the most progressive person. You know, you got to uh, just put all your support behind them because it's all we can do in this very reactionary, you know, landscape that we live in. But what I, I think is important are the everyday interactions that people on the left can have in order to slow walk people, right? Because if I go onto the job site and I'm in the shanty and I hand somebody some fucking Trotskyist literature and I say, hey, First day on the job, I'm a communist. Are you one too? I, I'm not going to get anywhere. If, I'll probably just get laid off, honestly. <laughs> but I had an interesting thing happen to me this last week where, you know, I got to work and I've been at this job for like almost six weeks now. And I haven't, as always, I don't bring up politics whatsoever. I try to ignore them, especially when it's like Trump's great or, you know. Uh, these fucking immigrants, you know, I just, I, I don't, do not want to get engaged in these fucking shit storms. But I go into the shanty in the morning and the guys are talking about politics. And 
I kind of I'm listening to them and they're talking about how fucked up Trump is. Now, this one dude is a Latino from Queens. The other dude's a white dude from Long Island. So in both of those cases, you don't know what you're going to get politically, right? Because yeah. a Latino dude True. from Queens could be a Trump supporter, too. Mm-hmm. The white guy from fucking Suffolk County could definitely be a mm-hmm. Trump supporter. Trump did much better among Latinos than uh, people realize. Yeah, I, well, especially second or third generation ones. So at any rate, I'm listening and they're they're shitting on Trump and then they're shitting on our shop steward for being a Trump supporter. So I, uh, I kind of jump in and I say testing the waters they say well hillary clinton wasn't that great either and they're like ah they're you know she's just in it for the corporations and for the rich and shit i'm like ah now we're getting somewhere and then i i kind of tested the waters again and i was like say what you want about bernie sanders but you know he really stood for some for some you know things for working people and both of these dudes i would have had no idea were like yeah bernie sanders that guy's the shit man he fucking stands up for people like for working people you know, they didn't say, oh, he's a socialist, he's scary and everything like that. So I got to this point now where I could start to engage them uh, on the level that they were at. And the way I did that was I didn't immediately say, oh, well, you guys are sympathetic to Bernie Sanders. Why don't you vote for this Democrat in this particular election coming up? Right. We started talking about taking the sort of principles that Bernie Sanders was talking about and applying them to the workplace. Right. And talking about. Oh, what, you know, Bernie's talking about unions and he was out on strike support. Yeah, strike support. That was great. And then talking about all the perils that we face within the building trades in New York and this, that, and the other thing. And as the weeks go on now, I know that these two particular workers, not the shop steward who's a Trump supporter, I know that these guys are potentially open to the conception of some idea of socialism, as you were talking about, Asher, right? It's Thanks, Bernie. Opening. Yeah, mm-hmm. right. It's an opening now where these people who might not have been sympathetic to some idea of the S word, I can now work on a shop floor level uh, in order to potentially do something interesting within the rank and file. And I'm sorry, again, to all you people out there who thinks politics is pulling a lever every fucking two to four to six years. All right. Politics is also what you do in the shanty. Politics is mm. also what you do uh, on the on the floor of Walmart. Politics is what you do in your community and in the fucking streets. And that's what separates leftists from liberals is that we understand that ultimately at the end of the day, whether your horizon is social democracy or whether your horizon is the abolition of fucking capitalist social relations that at the end of the day it is only the self-activity conflictual relationship between capital and labor and labor's capacity to shut shit down that will lead to a better world beyond inequality everything good (laughs) that's it that's all i gotta say boom